What's up, everybody? We are back. John Delarose here, Delarose.com. That's D E L A R R O Z.com. And we have The Invaders, The Complete Collection, Volume 1. Very nice uh, old school war poster advertising on here. This is an out of print book I've been searching for for forever and finally got a copy thanks to my boy Drew. So, Drew, shout out to you for getting this to me uh, at cover price. I really appreciate it. Um, it is a very thick book. This is slightly thicker than most epic collections as a complete collection here, and it covers a lot of issues. Giant Size Invaders 1, Invaders 1 to 22, and Annual 1, two issues of Marvel Premiere, and Avengers 71. And they do all matter into the context of this. It, it, this was very well formatted and laid out and mapped, so I appreciate the people who did the work uh, in order to get this done. It's written completely by Roy Thomas. Most of it was done by Frank Robbins, but we got some other pencilers in there. And the high concept of this is taking Marvel's 1940s characters, or it was Timely's at the time, uh, who is the Human Torch, Toro, his sidekick, Captain America, Bucky, his sidekick, and the Submariner. And they were the most popular characters of that era. And they kind of let Timely, you know, survive into the 50s and, and then become Marvel eventually. And uh, so they are classic characters, and Roy Thomas wanted to bring them back and actually tell adventures set in the 1940s at the time as a superhero team. Now, they teamed up a few times. Uh, they had all winners comics where they teamed up a little bit. Young allies, the, uh, the um, sidekicks would team up. And that happened a little bit. But what was missing from a lot of those 40s comics is these guys never put in supervillains like we have in the Silver Age for the most part. They were always fighting against just baseline random Nazis and things like that. Uh, so you never got to see them fight people of their own power caliber. And so with the team up and with Roy Thomas having done Avengers for a couple of years by this point in his career, uh, he made a nice super team and started putting them against uh, villains that make a little bit more sense uh, for them to be fighting. So it's a pretty cool concept. Vince Coletta did the inks uh, here and Frank Robbins has mentioned it most of the, the actual uh, book writing on the main book. So they team up, uh, we get to introduce the characters and they start fighting these Nazi characters in the beginning. They're usually two, we get a, a, a super Aryan dude, of course. Uh, and this is how we kind of introduce the invaders for the first book. Uh, Roy Thomas gives a whole nice perspective on how he you know, came about uh, doing this stuff. And there's a couple of these in the book and they're, they're fascinating, fascinating history, very nice to read. As we get into the actual invaders, that was the giant size to kind of launch it. And now we get the all new number one, of course. Uh, there's this ring and they're they're chasing after what's going on. There's a lot of air scenes here because they, they do a lot in London and they do a lot with the aerial battles between the Germans and the British here. Um, and each issue really has, there we go, some more uh, detail on this, has like, a, you know, it's usually a two or three parter to it for the most part. And there's these, these weird Norse looking guys who end up being kind of aliens who were sent back. And there's this evil brainiac character. So, they, so Roy Thomas introduces some really neat characters uh, of this. And it turns out these guys lost their memory and were kind of brainwashed by the Nazis, of course, because that's what goes on. And then they, uh, you know, blow up their whatever. <laughs> So it starts out pretty fun, um, and it took me a sec to get into this. And the reason it took me a few issues really to get into this is, you know, you kind of know what happens to these characters, and it's always hard to do a prequel, of course. And Roy Thomas really lays heavy thick on the dialogue, so uh, every panel moves really slowly until you get used to reading this. Uh, you know, I know Stan Lee did that also in this era, and it is an indication of the era in some degrees, but Stan Lee had a gravitas to it or, or a sort of uh i don't i don't know the word i'm looking for exactly a, a spunk to it maybe that that was a little bit more interesting and holds your attention a little better than roy thomas's does now the art's fine this is very standard comic fare and and you know there's nothing like innovative about it that you can see here like a kirby or ditko piece but it, it works for what it is um they introduce things very well and then they kind of take out the backgrounds for for speed purposes uh, throughout these deals. The Coming of You Man, Scourge of the Seas. There we go. <laughs> so uh, lots of lots of uh, lots of army action as they're as they're going on missions. 
and they're fighting in the ocean this time. But it really starts to pick up a little bit later. So we'll, we'll kind of flip until we get there at this point. Back to America and suddenly we get the Red Skull because what would a Captain America adventure be without a Red Skull plot? And what happens at this point, the invaders get brainwashed and they become Nazis themselves. And so Roy Thomas introduces all these other Golden Age characters uh, called the Liberty Legion in Marvel Premiere, and this all crosses over. So there's like a five-part story here, and Bucky kind of leads them because he's the only one who doesn't get brainwashed. And we introduce all these cool new characters, a couple of which continue on through here. Um, and uh, Roy Thomas talks about the Liberty Legion here and gives a little background on that so you can know his care for the history of comics. And that honestly makes it all worth it, just, just these sections right here. But the invaders are brainwashed and the Liberty Legion is trying to stop them, but how can they stop the most powerful heroes that are out there? Oh my gosh. Uh, back into that, and uh, this is where we're in Marvel Premiere again. Very nice storyline. Uh, this is probably the first one that really held my attention uh, all the way through a lot better than the other ones. Now after this last Marvel Premiere, I guess they were trying to get the Liberty Legion going as its own title, possibly too, if it had enough uh, interest, and it apparently didn't, because it didn't come back. Our invaders then go back over to the London area and we get this Baron Blood who's a vampire. And this is where the, the storyline really picks up. We meet this girl who the Human Torch falls in love with and she's more interested in Captain America than him and there's this push and pull over the next several issues that are really fun. And we meet a new character, Union Jack, who's leading the charge uh, along with the Black Knight uh, and a couple others uh, who I, uh, here we are, the Crimson Cavalier, the Phantom Eagle, Yes, Sir Steel and Silver Squire. I'm sorry, that was not the Black Knight. I thought it was the Black Knight the first time I read. But uh, introducing more characters. So Roy Thomas comes up with some neat stuff about this British super team that was out there. And there's this evil vampire that is around and, and causing all sorts of hijinks. And Union Jack uh, is now old because he was from World War I. And he's got a daughter and he's got a son who's not there. And he's got a guy who's living with them who, guess what? He's the evil vampire, and for some reason, even though he's obviously the evil vampire, nobody knows it. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we start out, beautiful spread here, where we get to meet the people. And uh, we are slowly learning about this vampire character and what's going on. Union Jack comes back into action here, which is awesome. And uh, our, our esteemed Gal, her, his daughter gets kidnapped by the, by the vampire, of course, and Torch goes after her, and they take down the vampire, because that's what you do. Fun stuff. Absolutely fun storyline. But this is where it really gets to be serialized. So there's a lot of uh, back and forth at this point that continues to the story. The gal is dying because of the, the bite at this point, and, uh, and this is interesting. So in the next couple issues here, in order to catch up, they just did this like sort of uh, wraparound where they're, they're taking her to the hospital. And by the way, I'm gonna recount my uh, adventure that, that reminds me of this. And then they actually reprint an old Captain America comic from the 40s at this point. Um, and once they get to the hospital, uh, we, uh, they rescue her and the Human Torch, even though he's a, I never understood the Human Torch so much. He's an android, but he gives her a blood transfusion. I don't know how he has blood. It doesn't make sense, but he does. And they always rode that line between, like, they called him an android in the first Human Torch Golden Age issue, which I read. And then they really acted like he wasn't an android for, like, the rest of the series. There's very little to do with that. It was, a, it was a strange setup, this Human Torch thing. So he gives her blood, uh, and she still goes to Captain America after, which, which hurts the Human Torch's soul. And then some dude scientist in there makes this bullet armor or whatever, and they, uh, they take him down. So uh, she's back out and the Human Torch is so upset, he rides off. He's like, oh my gosh, how could I ever compete with Captain America? Very sad, tragic. And when they go out, uh, of course there is uh, issues and because of the blood transfusion, she now has powers and, and flame powers and things like that too. And she now has a character Spitfire, which I really like the design of. I think she, she is bright and fun and full of 70s glory. And I love it. <laughs> so very cool stuff. And of course they fight Nazis. So <laughs> um, let's see. 
At this point, they get kidnapped, and they're all kidnapped by this evil Nazi overlord, and they get a giant golem to, to face in the middle of this, and they do so. How exciting. And we get a second saga showing up, the Crusaders. Roy Thomas seems to like to invent all these teams at this point. The Crusaders are some random characters also that I don't think they were around in the past. I think they were invented for this. But they're saving things around England and uh, doing their thing. And guess what? Turns out the Nazis are controlling them. Dun, dun, dun. And they force them to fight the invaders at some point. So that's what goes down, and they, they figure that out uh, here. Okay, we get into a big annual issue where this is a neat one too. So the concept of this one, Roy Thomas really uh, kind of innovated story-wise with it. But you have the team fighting, and they split off. And the team then, like the Human Torch gets his, like, his moment for a few pages. Captain America then gets his moment for a few pages. They, both, they all end up in disaster for our, our heroes. Submariner gets his own. And then they're all captured together, so they're all together. And they show up and they end up having to fight the Avengers here. And what's neat, after this, I'll just, I'll, I'll flip to the back of the book. What's neat is this was, he explains the whole setup and scenario here. Was there was an Avengers issue, I guess several issues before, towards the back, here we are. And in this one, uh, bef like Roy Thomas actually had them fighting the old timely characters before he even had an Invaders book. So uh, this, it ends up there's like a Kang time plot going on right here. And, and the annual actually retold it from the Invaders perspective and, uh, and, and changed the dynamics of what was going on there while this was an Avengers story. So very neat, uh, you know, it's a pretty cool crossover concept that like at this era in time, you never saw anything like that. So that is really cool, innovative stuff that he was doing. Now, um, they start off in a movie on the next one and we get our final sort of plot line here where um, there's this private that's captured uh, and the go and he gets captured by Germans, so the, the allies decide to go into Germany. We're gonna go capture him ourselves and then we get our weird dominatrix warrior woman <laughs> here. And literally Hitler, dun dun dun. Literally Hitler. <laughs> literally Hitler. <laughs> I know. I guess, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't as played out in the 70s as it was now. It's, it's kind of difficult uh, to take this stuff seriously at this point, but this is kind of a kid's book too, so it's, it's interesting. Uh, but Hitler's got his like Aryan super soldier and he's got his uh, Aryan mistress chick too. And uh, they capture the invaders after they go in. Oh, look at how angry she is. It's kind of a odd looking woman there. You know, this is a B tier Marvel artist at the time. It's not, not, our, not our Jack Kirby. Frank Robbins. Um, but it's fine, it's serviceable and fun. Moves the plot along. And they meet this uh, this new character uh, who shows up for a bit in Nazi Germany who help, helps Captain America and as, as they try to rescue them. Oh, more literally Hitler. And this goes on for a while. I mean, this is almost like full graphic novel length back then. And they really didn't do stories that, that went this long as they, they Keep getting captured. They're, they're now in the heart of Berlin, so they're really in trouble. And then they uh, they finally uh, escape and get an aircraft. And it turns out that character was the son of Union Jack, and he actually takes on the Union Jack moniker now. So we have Spitfire, uh, who's his sister, and then Union Jack is a, a character that I guess is going to continue on in the story after this too. So they escape, and it's fun. And that ends the storyline. And we get one more issue in this volume, which is uh, the untold origin of Toro, where uh, the Human Torch really recounts how he met Toro and why Toro's special, which is a really nice nice uh, character plot for the story. This was never told back in the 1940s. Uh, Human Torch just kind of encountered him at a circus, and he's like, oh, you're on fire too. Come with me, young lad. And that's basically all that happened. The 40s uh, books are kind of ridiculous. Uh, but this was pretty neat, and uh, we got uh, to meet that character and learn about that, and uh, then we get back into our deal. And, the, and I, I guess the, the overarching where he's telling this story is the repercussions of the last issue in the last storyline where Toro is, uh, is in a bunch of uh, medical trouble because of their 
escape. So they're just hoping he survives at this point. And that's it. I already ran over the last Avengers deal. So we've got that. We've got some extras in here. Um, but pretty neat. Like I said, uh, the first few issues, I found it a little hard to get into. Um, you know, those one-offs were just like, they weren't enough juice and enough character meat to really just like get you going. And the art's serviceable. It's just like nothing, you know, it's just house style. So there's nothing uh, exciting about it one way or another. Um, and so that's that. But once Roy Thomas really gets into those like story arcs, it makes the read well worthwhile. And those, those histories that he was very meticulous about these histories of the 1940s comics also makes it very worthwhile. So I'm glad he, I'm glad this exists. It was worth the read. There is a volume two that finishes up the series. And then there's a later series that gets collected with that too. And so we'll be going through that at some point. But this is good stuff. If you can find it, recommend picking it up for comics history. Eight out of 10, enjoyable stuff. And thanks everybody for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button. We'll be back soon.